All right, check, 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 check. Oh, man. Well, it's been a while, everybody. <laughs> it's definitely been a while. Um, I also hope, so there's so much going on in my house right now. We got victory crew season right now. My husband's running a victory crew upstairs. I can hear brother Jonathan Shears hollering in my kitchen. And thankfully, Blaze is actually sleeping through it all. So that's great. So, yes, I, as I'm doing this right now and as I'm recording, I still haven't necessarily found out the title of this uh, podcast today. But what we are going to be discussing is one thing that will truly destroy you and your walk with Jesus. And... I'm going to debunk a few things also throughout this podcast. And honestly, this might be fairly quick. I don't have a ton of notes, um, but I do know that it's definitely going to go somewhere. So without further ado, let's get into it. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you open our ears to listen, open our eyes to see. I pray that you open our minds to understand, and I pray that you transform our way of thinking because we know that if we allow you to change the way we think, you can absolutely change our entire life. So Lord, I pray that you speak through me. I pray that what you've spoken to me gets spoken out to others clearly and in an easy way to understand. Thank you, Lord, in your mighty name. We pray. I pray. <laughs> Amen. All right. So we're going to hop right into it because this is one thing that I feel like in the beginning of this message on one end of the I would say scale of Christianity because I swear there's like to too many spectrums of something that's supposed to be so simple. But nonetheless, what I want to talk about today, and like I said in the beginning of half, I feel like I'm going to get the end of one end of uh, Christianity and in the other end, I'll get the other. And spoiler alert, I am on the other. <laughs> I'm on the later end. Because I'm going to be talking about materialism and being materialistic as a Christian and how that truly, it will destroy you. It's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you and it will be your downfall. And before you, before anybody who knows me starts to rise up in a fence in their heart, first, let me just make this clear, I 100% 150,000% believe that we are meant to be prosperous, that I am prosperous, that I will continue to prosper exceedingly and abundantly. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, okay? So, but Erica, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean about, you know, having things and what... Uh, let me let me let me get there okay so materialistic mindsets and materialism i really genuinely feel as though it has crept its way into people's everyday life and that's from um you know excessive spending or needing to keep up with the Joneses and making sure that you have exactly what everybody else has and keeping up to trends and all of this other stuff. Um, soon I actually want to do another podcast, honestly, about the things, the, the, the traps and snares of genuinely the enemy who is out to kill, steal, and destroy all of us. Things that he's literally plotting and putting out every single day so that we can get off track. And one of those things I have found to be 100% materialistic 
mindsets, values, and just the idea that you need to have X, Y, or Z. The second thing is social media. Uh, there's no more social media anymore, but that's literally going to be another topic for another day. I believe that social media is actually dead. They just call it social media as a farce. And in actuality, it's consumer media because all you do is consume all day. There's no socialness about social media at all anymore. But I'm not going to get down that rabbit hole right now. I want to talk about this. Materialism, it will absolutely destroy you. It's going to, and I will literally prove it to you. And like I said, I believe in being prosperous. I believe in prosperity. However, I'm going to actually break it down for you first. So what is materialism or being materialistic? So straight from the get-go, like literal dictionary, Oxford Dictionary right here. Materialism is a tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. And that is the, the noun, okay? And it's also, there's a philosophy attached to it, but I'm not even going to care about that right now. Um, I'm just going to now say it because I brought it up. But th the philosophy is that the doctrine that nothing exists except matter and its movements and modifications, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the actual noun, the tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. That is what materialism is. And to be materialistic means that you're, and this is also another, right from the dictionary, adjective, excessively concerned with material possessions, money-oriented. So, um, and this is where I find that Christians really miss it. They miss it so hard when it comes to prosperity. Because God wants you to prosper, but he's not trying to make you excessively concerned with your possessions, okay? And I'll prove it to you right through the Bible. So the first thing I want to talk about is really, oh, I mean, there's literally so, there's, I feel like this is such a, this is such a dense um, piece of like download and I only literally have one sheet of notes and it's like scribbles practically because I felt like the Lord was just like quickly showing it to me and like putting it into like a circle for me but how do I know that God wants us to prosper and yes you can have nice things absolutely have nice things please have nice things um make your way up there. I mean, and this is the first thing is how I know that is if you go through the whole book of Second Chronicles, it goes through everything that Solomon did to build the temple, to build God's temple. Everything he put inside of it, the dimensions, all the exquisite, beautiful, uh, expensive even things that he bought in order to completely cover and um, embellish the temple of God. And so much so that in Second Chronicles 9, you have the Queen of Sheba hearing about Solomon's fame, okay? And she says to herself, well, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to go test this guy because his name is being spread. If your name is being spread around to queens and other areas, especially the Queen of Sheba, which we know in history was, how would I say? She was also very rich, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but the reason I say I guess she was rich is because of this solid fact was that when she went to Jerusalem and she saw the temple and she saw everything, the the I'll read it to you. I'll just read it right from the Bible. So in Second Chronicles 9, when the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. 
She arrived with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, large quantities of gold, and precious jewels. So I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> She's going there with all of this, these lavish things, okay? She's, you know, I, I can only imagine her going into this place to be like, oh, let's see how famous this Salman really is. I'm going to bring all of my caravan of camels, all of these spices, this gold, and all of these jewels. And I feel like it was almost like a way of showing herself off as well. Like, oh, you're so famous? Let's really see about that. I'm going to bring my things with me. And to continue, so when she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had in her mind. Which, ladies, we know. We got a lot to talk about sometimes, okay? We got a lot on our minds. <laughs> a lot on our minds. And being a queen, I can only imagine how much more. But Second uh, Chronicles 9-2 says, Solomon had answers for all her questions. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba realized how wise Solomon was, and when she saw the palace he had built, she was overwhelmed. She was so amazed at the food on his tables, the organization of his officials, and their splendid clothing, the cupbearers and their robes and the burnt offerings Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. That to me says just, I mean, she was able to understand Solomon's character, which is one aspect of this. But then she got to actually see the way people dressed, things that were, um, you know, I mean, I'm not too sure what kind of robes cup bearers would normally wear. But if you're, I don't, I can only imagine. She was probably overwhelmed. At the fact that all of this is so amazing. It's well put together. Everyone is just different. Everything was different for her. Because what she was coming from was a one godless place. And a materialistic mindset. That no matter how many camels she brought. No matter how much spices she stacked up on them no matter how much gold she brought or jewels she brought with her it did not matter because once she was not only in the presence of someone who had been with god and the wisdom that he bestowed on him she also got to see that there was a prosperity behind that as well and she was overwhelmed and then to continue you know Obviously, she has a life-changing experience if you continue reading in Second Chronicles. And then she gives. And then she gives a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold. <laughs> like, that's crazy. That's amazing and, and wonderful. That's a life-changing experience. Do you think Solomon needed 9,000 pounds of gold? Genuinely speaking, like, you think about it nowadays and it's like, if someone has a beautiful mansion and they have like five cars and they have all of these things, you'd think, why would I want to give to that person? Why would I want to give to that? There's a, there is a spiritual difference in her giving in that moment. And I'm going to get to that because the second part I want to get to is an instance of where materialism actually destroyed somebody. And, and made them turn away from Jesus. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it. And if not, turn to Matthew chapter 19. And you're going to hear about a rich man who, who the difference is between these two stories, which is honestly the most bizarre to me, is that the Queen of Sheba met Solomon, who is just a man on earth, who had been with God and spoken to God. Here, you have the rich man, who not only does not have a name in the Bible, but he speaks to Jesus himself. And so Matthew 19, 
verse 16, right? We'll just start from the beginning again. And I'm going to show you the two differences in these two stories. Aside from the outcome, listen to this. So Matthew 19, chapter 16. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? First of all, that's crazy because <laughs> it's crazy because it just says someone came to Jesus. He didn't have a name. He didn't have a title. And he didn't have anything. The Bible literally just refers to him as the rich man or some say like rich prince or rich ruler or something. My version I'm reading out of um, the NLT just says rich. It says someone, but it says the rich man. So teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? The man asked. Jesus replied, you must not murder, must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Well, he's already done all these. He's a great, he, pff, he's a good guy. Listen to that. He's a good guy, which is so common, I swear. He's a good guy, follows the commandments, wants to have eternal life. Let's see what happens next. So I already do all these things. What else must I do? Jesus told him, ah, and this is the thing, man. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, <laughs> if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And then next up is the scripture in which I feel like the non-prosperity people like to cling to when it comes to being prosperous versus being materialistic. Because Matthew 19 verse 23 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, and this is after the dude left, like sad and like i know the bible just says sad but like sorrowful like big sad okay then jesus said to his disciples i tell you the truth it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven i'll say it again it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven i mean the kingdom of god And this right here is the part where I get so twi like so frustrated because I don't get frustrated with what Jesus said, but I get frustrated when people use that to try to say that God doesn't want you to be rich. God doesn't want you to have money. God doesn't want you to be prosperous, to be well put like if you just look back at what I read about the Queen of Sheba, which in some cases people will say that she fainted because um, in the King James Version, it says there was no spirit left in her when she saw everything. When she saw how well put together, not even well put, how extravagant the temple of God was that Solomon built himself. Mind you, Solomon's not in debt. Okay, he's not in debt. He didn't put it on a credit card. He didn't, like, he, he paid for it himself out of the prosperity that God gave him. But notice that his, that Solomon was so wise. He had been with God. He was not attached to his things. He wasn't attached to his, his I guess, how would I say it? attached to his prosperity possibly what he was attached to was god he was directly in relationship with god that is what he did he and honestly churches need to be more like that today churches should be lavishly built 
You see mosques and temples. If you've ever been inside one of those, they're typically absolutely beautiful inside. Like, it's your jaw hits the ground. And nowadays, you walk in a church and it's just like paints chipping on the walls. It's very plain, mundane, very simple. Nothing is extravagant. Oh, you know, we don't want to... We don't want to be too much, you know, like I'm blessed, like my church, we're blessed to have people who take the way things look um, seriously. I mean, I wouldn't say that it, it doesn't run our life by any means, but what I would say is that they know what it means to want to lavishly build the temple and the place of God, like God's church, God's house. They want God's house to be looking good because it should be. Um, but those two instances, like this rich young man who is a good guy, follows all the commandments, doesn't murder, doesn't steal, no adultery, loves his neighbors, honors his parents. He's a good guy. But he could not let go of his stuff. And if he only knew what would have came from following Jesus... He would have gained so much more. And this is, this is what I want to explain to you, is that people try to say money is the root of all evil, okay? It's not. The m money is not the root of all evil. In 1 Timothy 6.10, all right, it says, Flip over there right now. And, I, and if, it's, if this is not underlined and stuck in your brain, you need to stick it in your brain. You need to put a, put a big, bright, sticky note right in there and never say this again if you've ever said it out loud because it's not true. If you've ever said that money is the root of all evil, rinse your mouth out with soap, okay? Because in the Bible, it says, and, and honestly, 1 Timothy 6, that whole area, false teaching and true riches. This is like, you know, the, the NLT's little um, titles over certain sections or whatever. Actually, we'll back it up. We'll bump it. No, let me see. Ah, yes, 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 yes. So we'll bump it back. Oh, man, I, I kind of want to read the whole thing. I'll just stick to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping around just because this, it's just such a, it's such a dense teaching. It really is, genuinely. Once you get this, you will understand. You really, really will. Like, if you're someone listening right now, and if you're someone who knows someone who believes that God does not want you to prosper, doesn't want you to have nice things, doesn't want you to, you know, you, you should be poor. You should be broke because of that, like, one proverb that says that better a person to be broke. No. No, 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 no. Because then why, why would all of what I had just said make any sense? Especially here where it says, for the love of money, the love of money, you must love money, okay? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money, craving money... Being materialistic, money oriented, okay, have wandered from the truth, the true faith, and pierced themselves with many sorrows. That's why people say money can't buy happiness. Money can't do this. Of course it can't. Obviously. But good thing that my happiness is not found in money. My happiness is found in God who blesses me, who literally blesses me. And it, honestly, there's so many Bible verses throughout the, the whole Bible that proves that God wants you to prosper. He, he really does throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's why I took something from the Old Testament with the Queen of Sheba and how, oh my gosh, awestruck she was seeing the temple that David built. Okay. And then you have someone, I mean, the temple that Solomon built. And then you see, I mean, I guess David funded it in some way, in most ways, actually. But 
whatever. I took something from the Old Testament and then compared it to something in the New Testament where someone, someone, literally it just says someone, was talking to Jesus himself in the flesh. Jesus in the flesh. And said, what can I do? And Jesus said, follow the commandments. He said, I do that. What else do I do? He was looking for what else because he knew. And this is the thing. He knew that being good wasn't good enough. And that is a whole other thing. Being a good person. It's not. It's. Yeah. You don't get into heaven by being a good person. Um. Man. You have him. He knew it. He knew. He's like, okay, but he was still seeking and searching, and he talked to Jesus in the flesh. And Jesus said, oh, okay, well, you do all these things? Cool. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And he couldn't do it. He was too attached to his stuff. He was too attached to his stuff. However, God does want you to be prosperous because he wants to bless you. But he doesn't want you to look at what he's going to be blessing you with or these things that he'll bless you with or the prosperity as your place of refuge or, that, or your place of joy or your place of strength or anything like that. He wants you to just look at it as, if I tell you to give that, you better be able to give it too. Because that's exactly what happened here. That man... The rich young man in the New Testament talking to Jesus in Matthew 19, he could not give. He only wanted for himself. And, and, even, and, and that's the thing. Giving is what will unlock it. Giving, and, and that's kind of like the crazy thing, but it's, it's God's economy. God's economy makes sense to God, okay? We can only understand it as much as we possibly can based on what the Bible tells us. But Luke 6, 38. And this is, what, this is what we're talking about here about being prosperous. So what does God want you to do? You know, okay, are you in this? Pl okay. All right, Erica, I hear you. You know, don't be materialistic. Don't fall into materialism. I shouldn't love my stuff. But what do I do when God gives me stuff? Like, you know, I want to be blessed. I want to be prosperous. I want, great. I love that you want to be prosperous. I love that you want to be blessed. However, the key, the actual literal key, you must give. You must give. You have to give. It's like a, it's like a, um, you ever, you, think of a pool, right? Think of a pool, like a above ground pool. I only think about an above ground pool because I don't know a lot about in grounds, but I'm sure they might work the same. An above ground pool has a filter on the side and it is constantly running around and around like you ever been in the pool with your friends and you just like go around in a circle and you like keep going around and around and around so a filter is there and um what else is in there like the um the filter and uh the pump so the pump and the filter are there there's water that's coming out of the pump into the pool that's how they work it makes sh make sure what and make sure that nothing gets gross and stale and disgusting in the pool you need to have it so that it functions well and that the water stays clean okay if you don't have something going out and coming in and going around and around and around and around and the water just gets stagnant and still it's a host for grossness. It's a host for developing bacteria, algae, bugs, disgust. I don't know if you've ever seen a pool with like a broken filter after even just a couple days. It start the water starts to get like algae green. The water even can get like slimy. It's gross. It's gross. 
but you must give. In Luke 6.38, it says, I have given, and it is given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, do men give into my bosom. For with the same measure I give, it is given back to me in overflowing abundance. That's the abundance. That's the prosperity. It comes from our giving. Because when we give, what we're showing God is this does not rule me. This is not something that I am attached to. This is not something that controls me. This is not something that I need even. This is something when like that's almost, it's like a test. Sometimes I feel like it's genuinely a test. God has tested me with giving. Oh, he has tested me with giving. And there have been moments where I did not listen and I felt disgusting. Just like I talked about with that pool. I did not put anything out, so nothing was going to come in. And I became stagnant until I finally listened on the third day, literally, of God telling me to do something. And I ended up giving one of the larger, largest offerings, largest seeds I'd ever sown. And when I tell you I reaped something so beautiful afterwards absolutely insane and even beyond that just you're you, what you're sowing into the ground second corinthians 9 6 even says i sow bountifully and i reap bountifully meaning that and, and this is the next thing this this talks about what jesus was telling to this guy this rich guy he had so many possessions and you know what jesus said sell everything sell everything give it to the poor and then come follow me. I, I wonder, I genuinely wonder what would have happened if that guy had just given, given and sold all of what he had. I wonder the treasures that he really would have had in heaven. I wonder. I really do. But it was it was something that was a weight on him because he allowed. Oh, I don't know if you guys can hear that. There's some serious stuff going on upstairs. <laughs> Scared me. But um, I lost my train of thought. To come back. <sighs> Too bad I can't like go back and listen to myself talk and be like, oh, what was I gonna say there? <laughs> Um, but yes, like the treasures he would have had, everything he would have had. I'm really trying to remember what I was going to say. Whatever. <laughs> I'm sure I would hope at least at this point, maybe you understand what I'm talking about. But honestly, there's, I could list probably over a hundred different scriptures. I could find, I could find over a hundred scriptures in the Bible that talks about how God wants you to prosper. However, with that, he's not saying I want you to prosper so that you, you just hoard it up and you don't give it away. Why do you think that when the, uh, when they were leaving out of Egypt that he said, it was such a test of trust of God trying to say, I will provide for you. Do not worry. Because God does want to provide for you in exceedingly and abundantly, literally. Like John 10, 10, Jesus came that I have life and have it more abundantly. He came so that you can have life more abundantly. He didn't just come and die for you. Like, yes, the main thing, Jesus came died for your sins so you can go to heaven you have to literally you, but you have to believe that to go to heaven um that's what i meant earlier you have to actually believe that confess it with your mouth that jesus has learned that on the third day he rose again that he died rose again on the third day for your sins and you need to confess that with your mouth that's how you get to heaven that's how you get to heaven okay but he came for that that is like the main amazing wonderful thing salvation that he came for but it does not end there and that's where people like to stop people like to just like man 
they like to have a half a half donkey life. <laughs> Because I'm not going to say the other thing, but they like to just, like, only get, a, like, salvation's just the, the, the outer, the, the beginning of what Jesus came and died to do for you. So that what you can have, what you can do, what you can do for the kingdom. Like, you ever met somebody who just has a lot of stuff? And they just like can't get rid of it. And they like, oh, no, it means something to me. It means something to me. That thing has become an idol over their life now. And that and that's what and that's what that's where that materialism mindset comes in. They're concerned with their material possessions. They're they're. Material possessions are so important to them that they can't even get rid of it or else it would just hurt them so much. Like, it's just crazy. It's honestly wild. And that's when you get, you know, man, I guess I really could talk about this for a while. I don't even know how long I've been. Oh, 35 minutes so far-ish. But this is what I'm talking about. I get so frustrated when people try to say that God wants you broke. That it's better to be broke. Oh, you know, I'll be, I, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I may have nothing. I may not have enough money in my bank account to pay my bills, or I may not have enough to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, but God wants it this way for me. No, he, he really doesn't want it that way for you. What he wants is to be able to bless you to build his kingdom because that's where the giving goes. The giving goes into what God has told you to give to, meaning that you're following his instruction. He'll just bless you more. And that was one of the things that back in, um, I pull it up really quick. In uh, first Timothy that I was going to talk to because one of the best things that I've ever heard, and this was from Bishop Rick Thomas, who, <sighs> is a mighty man of God who knows what he is talking about when he's talking about finances. He doesn't need people's money. He doesn't need people's giving. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, he comes and he speaks at um, our church a couple times a year, some mostly, and he's like, I'm not taking an offering. He's like, I want to get the money to you guys. Like, I don't need it. And pff, people will still bless him anyways because that's one amazing soil to be putting your seeds in okay but two what he talks about is that if you go into something and all you want is to get money oh, i'm gonna do this because i want to get money i want to do this because i want to get money i want to do this because i need money i need money 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 you are starting to put the money above the maker okay you're starting to become too money oriented and not putting your hope and trust and faith in Jesus. When, they're, when, they, when they left Egypt, God was like, I will give you manna each day. Do not save any for the next. Or else it will get discussed. And people did it anyways. Out of fear that they might not have enough the next day. When in reality, God is like, I will take care of you. I will take care of you. I will take care of you. More than enough for you to eat. More than enough for you to drink. More than enough. More than enough. Do not save it for the next day. God was trying to tell them that abundant living comes only from him. It doesn't, you know, budgeting is great. Planning out is great. Those things are wonderful. Your savings account, great. Do all those things. Be wise. You know, don't, don't just live frivolously. But God wants you to put his, your hope and faith and trust in him alone. And give when he tells you to give. And then he will give back to you. And, and, and the beautiful thing is that when you give, like what it says in, um, what it says in Luke 6, 38, it, get, it, get, it comes back to you running over, shake, pressed down, shaken together with good measure. It is abundantly better. Overflowing. 30, 60, 100 fold people, okay? Like 
sometimes I've, I've, you know, this has happened to me and this is how sometimes I feel about giving in some ways, but, and even, um, our pastor, Pastor Brian has said this, that if you get something and it doesn't fulfill a need, it's probably a seed. It does not fulfill a need in your life. It's probably a seed. Because if you gave, let's say you gave, believing for a harvest in order to get X, Y, or Z. Actually, you know what? I'm going to use a testimony of a, of a dear friend of mine who sowed seed into the kingdom of God for a car. She did not have a car. For years, she did not have a car. She did not have a car in Bible college. She didn't, and she lived out of state. She went to the river in Florida. She's from Massachusetts. And it's a powerful testimony because she gave literally, like she. when I tell you she gave, she gave a, a, what she could. And, and this is about, man. I'm like overlapping and overlayering so many things right now, but let's say she gave a hundred dollars. When I tell you that she gave a hundred dollars, I mean that she maybe had like nine dollars left in her bank account. Okay, that's the kind of giving, and that's the kind of faith that she had in God. That's the kind of faith that she had in the God who literally is going to give unto her good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. All right. Do men give into her, okay? Her storehouse, her bosom, okay? And she gave while she was at Bible college, believing that God was going to give her a car. I think it was maybe, I think she told me three years later. She comes up. God told her to come back to Massachusetts. She's sitting in service. And we, as a church, pastor felt prompted to give away two brand new vehicles. No debt, no loan. Like, pastor is like, we're going to go up and we're going to buy two cars and we're going to bring them down and I'm going to pray about who to give them to. And wouldn't you stinking know? Guess who was one of the people who received a, an amazing, her name, I think she named her car Esther. I think her name, I think her car's name is Esther. She got a car. She got a car because she felt that leave. Okay. She felt that $100. And I'm just using that as an example because I actually don't know the legitimate amount. She felt that $100 leave her life. With $9 remaining in her bank account. And she reaped bountifully. Because she sowed bountifully. It's like the woman with two pence. Two mints or whatever. What a, in today's language would be like two pennies. The old woman. Who wanted to give into the kingdom. Give to Jesus. She only gave like two pennies over. I'm using pennies because I, I don't. I'm not going to look it up right now. She gave like two pennies. And Jesus legitimately said that she, she gave more than anybody else because she literally gave all she had. She felt that leave her life because that's all she had left. Meanwhile, you have people who did have money and giving like, you know, I'll give a little bit here, a little bit there. You know, it, they didn't feel leave their life. But they were attached to what they had. They were attached to what they had and not to who is going to bless them even more. So, I really hope that this encouraged somebody and taught somebody and helped bring a clear understanding of what God wants for your life. He wants you to have good things, okay? There are none around me that lack any good thing, all right? Jesus came that I have life and I have it abundantly. I have been made rich in every way so that I can be generous on every occasion. And through this, God gets the glory. That's 2 Corinthians 9 11. I have like a whole list of scriptures here that I was going to go over, but I'm already over the time that I 
thought that I thought this was only going to be like 20 minutes and here we are. <laughs> but I'm telling you guys, God wants you to live a life of abundance. He wants you to have nice things. He wa He doesn't want you to always have like the hand-me-downs of everything, okay? He wants you to go out to the store and buy something that's like $1,000 and have it not even phase you, okay? Or whatever. He wants you to buy a brand new car off the lot in cash. He wants you to buy a house in cash with no debt. He wants you to be able to do that. He absolutely does. And he will bless you the more that you not only trust him, but as you give. Giving unlocks it. Giving is really what it comes down to. That's what he wants you to do. Because when you give, you're proving and you're showing him that the things are not what is bounding you. It's what you own and what you have isn't, it's not stopping you from doing whatever God has told you to do. So, and if you feel prompted to give, you guys should give. I'm telling you. If, you know, first, you should definitely tithe 100%. Tithe into the church that you go to. If you're going to Crossroads because that's where I go, you put in an offering to Crossroads right now. Put in an offering to your pastor. Do it. If God has told you to do it and you're like, oh, I don't know, I really, you know, I was saving up for this or that. Like, come on. Like, you're, you're literally holding yourself out from being blessed right now. If God has told you to do that, I feel it. I feel it literally on me right now. Thank you, Father, for showing us what it means to give. Thank you, Father, for showing us that what we have and even the things that you give us still do not bound us. That if you, like, if you gave us something and you told us to give it, we would do it out of obedience to you, knowing that when we give, it is given unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I thank you for the overflowing abundance from our giving. I thank you, Father, for it. I thank you that you came so that I can have life and have it more abundantly. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you that when I sow, I reap bountifully. I thank you. These, all of these things that we can confess over our life right now. I thank you, Lord, for doing it. I thank you that those who are listening to the sound of my voice right now, when they feel prompted to give, that they give. They give into their church. They give into their, to their pastor. And if they want to give to this podcast and get the word out even more, so be it. Amen and wonderful. I made I've made all the ways that to give unto I guess this podcast and youth ministry available on um my beacons page already. And I don't even honestly ever talk about sowing seeds into I would say me but it's Honestly, the on honestly the ministry. My husband and I are youth pastors. We are literally believing our youth ministry is about to go to the next level, and our giving is a part of that as well. So, if you'd like to give into this podcast, I've made it all available on. You can go to my Instagram page. I think it might be also in the captions here. Ways to give. <laughs> but please, give into your church. Give into your pastor. Je like, really, like, in because when you give, when you give, giving unlocks so much more than what you could ever imagine. Do not fall into the materialistic trap that the enemy has laid for you. He does not want you to prosper. He doesn't want good for your life. He doesn't want you to be able to be in the cycle of reaping and sowing. He doesn't. He wants you to be connected to your items. He wants you to feel like if you gave something away, then you may never have it again. He wants you to feel that way. 
Now I'm preaching to myself. I just got rid of so much crap because I've had it for too long. And I had it when I was younger or something like that. And I wanted the memories and whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to make new memories in my life and they're going to be way better than my childhood, okay? <laughs> so there's that. So Lord, I thank you for this podcast. I thank you for the people listening, Lord. I pray that they share it with someone. I pray that it helps them understand. I pray that this was an easy to follow explanation as like I said I had very simple notes and in my mind it makes sense but to other people it might not but Lord I thank you I thank you Father that you will bless those listening right now through their giving and through their obedience to you alright y'all until next time catch you later